Ruchem Agoyim. Again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. So, this week on my thoughts, now I would like to continue our virtual tour of the Mishkan and its vessels. Last week, we concluded our discussion with the Kruvin, the two childlike figures that rested on the cover of the Ark. This week, I'd like to continue with that topic. Hopefully, we can gain a deeper understanding into the symbolism connected with the Kruvim. Now, the Kruvim that rested on the cover of the Ark are portrayed as loving children. However, in the book of Genesis, the cherub that stands guard at the entrance to Gan Eden, to the Garden of Eden, is described as a destructive angel with a fiery sword. So which is it? It would seem that both options are possible. When bringing up children, if we allow them to follow in the path of the secular world, many times they may go in the path of evil and destruction. However, when we connect them to the ark, meaning to the Torah and mitzvahs, then they are more likely to grow up to be warm and loving individuals. You know, when a child is connected to the luchos, which allude to the Torah and mitzvahs, they can develop as a son of Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, whom the Torah refers to as a Ish Tam, a perfect individual. However, when a child is not connected to the Torah, then he may take a sword in his hand and become, become a son of Esau, again, the other son of Yaakov Avinu. The Elena Lashabayak, based on the Talmud and Baba Basra, states that when the Keruvim were facing each other, then it showed God's approval of the children of Israel. This phenomenon was meant to teach us that it is God's desire that we face other people, meaning that we should care for other people's needs, both physically and spiritually. Since if all of a person's concerns are only selfishly about themselves, then the Kruvin would turn away from each other and signify God's displeasure. In addition, the Talmud and Baba Basra also discusses the difference between the Kruvim that were fashioned by Moshe, which faced each other, and those that were fashioned by Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, which faced the temple. Our sages tell us that in the time of Moshe, the children of Israel did the will of God. However, in the time of Shlomo, they did not. According to Hasidus, when the Kruvim faced each other, this was a sign that the nation was performing God's will when they turned away from each other, each in its own corner, it suggested that the nation was only concerned about their own selfish egos. They were no longer serving God Almighty. In reality, they were now serving themselves. The Malbim says that the Kruvim were an allusion to two types of mitzvot, those between man and God and those between man and man. And just as the two tablets were representative of these different, two different types of mitzvot, so too are the children of Israel represented by two different types of leaders. One, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, who represented man's obligation to God, which was connected with the first tablet. While the king represented those laws that apply to our relationship with man, which is connected to the second tablet. In addition, according to Hasidus, the last letter in the words, Upenehem Ish El Ochid, with their faces one towards the other, again referring to the Kruvim, spelled the Hebrew word Shalom, peace. This is an allusion to the concept of peace and brotherhood that should hopefully exist amongst the children of Israel. It is this trait that the Kruvim served to stress. It states in Bir HaChumash, that the Kruvim had the faces of small children. This was, this was an indication that God Almighty views us as his children. This fact is important, since the love that a father has for his children is not dependent on whether they are good or bad, regardless of their actions. A father still loves them dearly. A father's love is unconditional. The Torah tells us that God Almighty spoke to Moshe, me bain, Shnei HaKruvim, from between the two Kruvim, meaning that when God Almighty communicated with Moshe, God's voice emanated from between the two figures above the ark. If you were to take the first letter of the three Hebrew words 
um, Mem, Shin, and Hay. Together they spell out the name Moshe. Moshe was the only prophet to whom God Almighty spoke to in this fashion. The next item that is mentioned in the Torah is the Shulchan, the table. Why does the Shulchan precede the menorah? Because the Shulchan represents materialism and the menorah represents spirituality. Torah, just like the tribe of Zvulun, the businessmen, preceded the tribe of Yisachar, the Torah scholars, and so too here. That being the case, then why did the Ark precede the Shulchan, since the two represented Torah? The Hassam Sofer stated, because the Ark represents a Torah scholar who doesn't need to be supported by anyone. In fact, he may well be like Rebbe Hanina ben Dosa, about whom it was stated that the whole world was supported due to his merit. The Hassam Sofer also stated that the Ark preceded both the Shulchan, the table and the menorah, the candelabra, to teach us that every Jew, every Jew has a need and an obligation to study Torah. However, those Torah scholars who study and serve God with sophisticated and in-depth learning of Torah should be supported by the community and freed from many financial worries, which is alluded to by the Yisachar Zavulan relationship. The significance of placing the Shulchan in the Mishkan was a reminder that all material blessings are channeled to us from God Almighty. However, in order for that blessing to grow, it must have some root from where it can draw from. The Shulchan represents that root, something that is physical so that God's blessing can rest upon it. Like the story of Elisha and the book of Malachim and the prophet Ovadja's wife, where um, she, he gave, Elisha gave her a blessing that the oil that she would pour would continue flowing until she had filled every container that she had collected in her home. From this famous story, many have taken up the custom of leaving some bread on the table when they recite the grace after meal, again, based on Ramban. The Shulchan, the table, was placed on the north side of the holies, and the menorah, the candelabra, was placed on the south side. This was not done randomly. Our sages tell us that if a person wants to connect to spirituality, well, they should pray from the south side of the synagogue. That was the side where the menorah was placed in the Mishkan. On the other hand, if an individual desires financial success, well, then they should pray towards the north. That was the side where the shulchan that housed the showbreads was kept. As we read in the book of E of Job, Mitzafon Zahab Yes, uh, that gold, meaning riches, comes from the north. The order of the Torah's description of the items found in the Mishkan teaches us a great deal about the relationship that exists between the Torah and its supporters. The Shulchan proceeded the menorah to teach us, as the saints in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Rebbe Lozim and Azariah said, in Ein Kemach, Ein Torah, that if there's no flower, then there can be no Torah. However, the Ark symbolized that im ein Torah ein kemach, that if there's no Torah, then there is no flower. This tells us that both are dependent upon each other. Now, the dimensions of the top of the Shulchan were all in whole numbers. This was, again, to tell the businessman that he should be positive and aggressive in his attempt to attain wealth. However, the height of the Shulchan was in halves, to say that at the same time, he should retain his humility. He should always remember from where his success really originates from. In addition, the Shulchan was a half armor amma, smaller than the Ark, which alludes to the fact that Torah creates the possibility of lengthening a person's life, whereas money and power many times shortens one person's life. Now, the wood that was used in the construction of the Mishkan was atse shitim, meaning acacia wood, a type of cedar. This wood was very special. God Almighty had told Yaakov, we know Jacob, our father, when he was leaving the land of Canaan during the famine, to join Yosef in Egypt, that he should take young cedar sprouts and plant them in Egypt. Yaakov Vino told his sons before he died that when they would leave Egypt, that they should be sure to take these cedar trees with them. They may not have understood the reason for his request, however, when they left Egypt, they followed their patriarchs Yaakov's instruction 
and they cut down the cedars and took them with them into the desert. At this time in history, people were even known to worship trees. Again, they were called an Asherah tree. The Aquilavina wanted to be certain that the wood that would be used to build the holy Mishkan would be free of any taint of idol worship. Rav Simcha Kohn stated that in the future, this Shittim wood would act as an atonement for the three cardinal sins that the nation would transgress in the 40th year of their journey in the desert. Their sin occurred in the place called Shittim. The three cardinal sins that they transgressed were murder, sexual improprieties, and idol worship. These are the three commandments that a person must give up their life for rather than transgress. Rabbeinu Bachai states that now that we can no longer bring sacrifices, that one's table serves as a substitute for the altar in the temple. Therefore, a person's table has the power to serve as an atonement for their sins, again, much like the altar did. In fact, it became the practice of many of the righteous Jews of France that when they died, they would use the wood from their dining room tables to construct their caskets. Just as their death served as a means of atonement, so too their table served as a form of atonement for all of their sins. It also served as a witness that was able to testify to all the mitzvot that were performed on and through it. This was also an illusion that when a person dies, they take nothing physical with them on their journey to the next world, other than their good deeds. This is what their table symbolized. The Hebrew word for a table is shulchan. It is spelled shin, lamed, chet, and nun. These four letters form a acronym. Shin for shalom, peace. Lamed for levia or love, to escort a guest or to extend a loan. Chet for chen, showing favor. And the nun for nechama, giving comfort. The Torah states that the shulchan should be overlaid with pure gold. This fact is important. It states in Eturi Torah that the Shulchan symbolized how a person should conduct their business. From the fact that the Shulchan required pure gold, we learned that our business dealings should be pristine, without any hint of dishonesty, thievery, or interest. The Gemara of the Talmud tells us that the first question that one is asked by the Heavenly Court on their Day of Judgment is, were you honest in business? The Torah continues and states that the Shulchan would be constructed with poles made of acacia wood, overlaid with gold. Torah Shalema states that even in the temples, these poles were still attached to the Shulchan. In the desert, again, it was logical to attach poles. After all, the table that they tra was transpired by the nation whenever they traveled from place to place at a moment's notice. However, that was not the case once it resided in the temples. It seems that when the people came to the temple for the festivals, the Kohanim, the priest, would take the Shulchan outside of the Hechel, where the Shulchan rested. They would bring the Shulchan with the twelve showbreads into the courtyard for all of the people to see. Well, this allowed the people to witness the miracle that was exhibited by the twelve showbreads. Though the showbreads rested continuously on the golden table from week to week, the people were still able to view the steam rising from the lows, as if they had just left the oven. This was to impress upon them just how much they were beloved by God, their loving Father in heaven. This was one of the ten open miracles that prove that God's presence resided in his house. The twelve breads that rested on the Shulchan were called Lechem HaPonim, the bread of faces. They were baked in iron molds that were open on either side. So as they baked, they crusted and formed faces on both sides, ergo, the bread of faces. The breads were actually thick matzah. The Aksel Yacobola brings up a, a, an interesting point. The Hebrew word lechem is singular. One would have thought that they would have been, been that it would have been referred to as lachme, upon them, the breads of faces, plural. From the fact that they referred to in the singular tense teaches us that even if one of the 12 loaves was missing, it would nullify the entire offering, even though there were still 11 loaves left. In addition, the showbreads were necessary since in order for a blessing to materialize, it must rest on something 
tangible. Lechem, bread. Bread is referred to as the staple of life. This may also be a reason as to why there is a custom to leave over some bread on our table after we finish a meal, so that when we recite the grace after meal, the birchat amazon, the blessing will have something tangible to rest upon. In verse 2530, it states that the bread should remain on the shulchan, tamid, meaning always. The Torah Shlema states that from the word tamid, we learn, even on the Shabbat. The Shabbat was the time when the Kohanim would ritually remove the old bread that had rested on the table all week, and then replace them with 12 freshly baked breads. In fact, at the same time that the old breads were being removed from the table, the new breads were replacing the vacancy. There was never a moment when all 12 breads were not resting on the table. This fact was true even when they traveled. Even then, the showbreads were not removed. They always remained on the table. You know, I would like to end with a story told in connection with the showbreads that were brought in the temple. This, this story took place in the city of Tzfat, in, the, in Israel. In the city there resided an unlearned Murano from Spain. One day when he was in the synagogue, he heard about the showbreads and how much God Almighty enjoyed them. And so he went home. And he told his wife that, that on Erev Shabbos, she should bake two special challahs, and that he would take them to the synagogue and place them in the ark with the Torah scrolls. And that is exactly what he did. His wife baked the two challahs with special care, and then before anyone else entered the shul, he placed them in the ark with a short prayer that he originated. Well, the next morning when he came to pray, he looked into the ark, and he was really overjoyed. The challahs were gone. He was so happy he couldn't wait to tell his wife. This went on for weeks. But then one week, the rabbi of the synagogue was sitting in the back of the sanctuary, and he was working on his Shabbat sermon. Curiously, he watched as the Murano opened the ark and placed two breads inside. As the Murano closed the curtain, the rabbi called out to him and asked him what he was doing. Well, he innocently told the rabbi that he was leaving a bread offering to God Almighty. Well, the rabbi responded and showed his disapproval regarding the foolish act performed by the simple and unlearned congregant. As they were talking, the shamus entered the synagogue, and he went directly to the ark. He didn't notice the rabbi or the Murano. He opened the ark and took out the two fresh hollows. Seeing the shamus, the rabbi laughed sarcastically. He said to the man, You fool, there is your God. It is the shamus who has been taking home your hollows every week. Well, the Murano left the synagogue, and there was no longer a smile on his face. The rebuke that he had received struck a chord deep inside of his heart. Shortly after the event, the rabbi received a message from the Arizal, the great Kabbalist, who was living at Sfat at the same time. The message told him to prepare himself for his demise, since he would not live out that Shabbat. As you can imagine, he was quite shaken, so he quickly went to see the Arizal. He asked him why he had been sentenced to die so quickly. The Arizal told him that not since the destruction of the Second Temple had God Almighty enjoyed a sacrifice as much as he enjoyed the two chalas that this simple Murano placed in the ark every Shabbat. The Arizal said, Since you have taken away God's enjoyment and in the proper process hurt the feelings of a simple Jew, God Almighty is taking your life. So from the story, we can learn a great lesson, that a person can even be right, and yet it can still cost them their life. On the other hand, a person can perform an act that is totally incorrect, and yet it can still bring God, his Father in heaven, a great amount of joy and satisfaction. After all, tefillah, prayer, is referred to as avodat halev, the service of the heart, a warm, private audience spent between a child and the loving Father in heaven. I think that we will end our tour at this point, and God willing, next week, we will continue with the menorah, the candelabra, that stood in the holy of, in, of the holy of the tabernacle. May God Almighty bring a quick and decisive end to this war, with the safe return of all the hostages, the speedy recovery of all those who were injured. May comfort all of those who have lost loved ones and protect all of the brave IDF soldiers together with those civilians all over the world 
people in harm's way with the coming of Shia Sukaino quickly and in our time. Now, again, let me thank you for attending and wish you a good Shabbos. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. Again, please make sure that you subscribe and uh, push the like button button and please share it with your friends. Again, thank you so much for listening. It's great. It means a great deal. And I hope you again have uh, learned something and uh, we can all grow together. God bless me well. Please stay tuned for a song that I'll be playing in just a minute. God bless. Shabbat Shalom.